I never missed a single day of school in grade school. I missed two days in high school, four years of high school. I missed none in college and none in the seminary. Has God blessed me with good health? Praise God. Absolutely. But there's also, there's another reason probably um, that that is true about me. Um, And that's because I suffer from a little bit of FOMO, fear of missing out. It drives me nuts thinking that I wouldn't be at school, that I would miss something in class, something that happened with my friends, stuff that was going on while I'm back, in my, uh, back at home in my room or in the dorm room. Like, I just, I don't want to miss the action. I don't want to be where, um, I don't want to not be where everything's going on. And so I just, I've always felt that I have a little bit of that kind of FOMO, fear of missing out in my life. FOMO, it's a real thing. You ever experienced FOMO? Ever, ever scroll through Facebook and start getting the, the terrible sinking feeling that, that your friends are having some serious fun without you? Or maybe, maybe uh, do, do you hate not being in the room where the rest of your team or the rest of your group is? Or um, if, let's say you're missing a day at work. Does it just drive you nuts that you're missing a day at work, the, the day that the big meeting is going to be happening? Or maybe you even have a very hard time taking a vacation because just deep down you fear that you're going to be missing out on something big. Or maybe you, you hate not being at the party that everyone else is invited to. Or how about just in the littlest of ways where even... Does it just drive you nuts that you can't be in the conversation at that table right over there? You're, you're like in a conversation at this table, but you see like a conversation going on over there in that table, and you just, you kind of want to be in on what's being talked about there, and you're just kind of, so you don't really connect here because you, it's just this fear of missing out what they're talking about over there. Chances are, I don't know if I've hit you yet or not, but like chances are we all suffer uh, with a little bit of FOMO, the fear of missing out. Now, FOMO... Um, FOMO is the feeling or perception that others are having more fun, they're living better lives, or they're experiencing better things than you are. And, and it's, it, it, it fills us with a, a deep sense of envy. It can affect our self-esteem. And it's not just the sense that there's something better we could be doing at this moment. It's the feeling that we are missing out on some, something fundamentally important that others are experiencing right now. And it could be anything from the Friday night party to, to someone getting a major promotion at work because you're not there. And FOMO... FOMO, it's been around for a long time. But social media has put it on steroids, hasn't it? Right? Because now, now we regularly, we are regularly comparing our normal lives to the highlights of other people's lives, right? Now we're not just imagining or fearing that maybe that our friends are having fun without us. We're seeing pictures of, that, that prove that they are having fun without us. And other people's promotions and, and the awards and achievements in life are being documented for the whole world to see. We're not making it up. And so we look, we look at this and we think, look at everyone's perfect lives. What am I missing? What am I missing out on here? And so FOMO, the fear of missing out, leads to a lower satisfaction of our own life. It leads to less satisfaction in our own life. It leads to the idea that that, that there's something we're missing that we don't have, and we could have more, and so we're less satisfied with our own life. And it can lead to unhealthy behavior. It can even be dangerous. And FOMO has been around for a long, long time time. In fact, in fact, it's what Satan used to ruin and destroy God's perfect creation. God's perfect world 
is described in this one verse, which is the first verse of our text. this, This one comment really describes and pictures for us how perfect God's world was. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. They were naked, and they were unashamed. Naked and unashamed. Now, this has nothing to do with nudity, okay? Understand what this is saying. This is saying that they they had this relationship with God and this relationship with each other where there was nothing to hide, nothing to fear, no no desire to escape, no no need to project a, a, a better image, a different image of ourselves. It was just, this is who I am, and I know God loves me anyway, I know I'm loved anyway, and I have nothing to hide, and I am missing nothing. This is naked and unashamed. That's what this is. This is who I am. I have nothing to hide. I'm missing nothing. Naked and unashamed. There's nothing to want. There's nothing to need. So Satan, Satan was going to need something. He was going to need a lure. He was going to need something that would hook them and pull them out of naked and unashamed. Because they had everything they needed. They, had, they wanted nothing. They lacked nothing. They were afraid of nothing. So he would need a hook. He would need a lure to hook them and pull them out of that. Satan was jealous of what they had because he didn't have that. And he wanted to ruin their relationship with God, and he wanted to destroy God's perfect world, and so he needed a lure. Now, lures, we got into a little bit, kids. Lures, they promise a reward, but they hide the very high price that it costs to receive the reward. Isn't that how a fishing lure works? It promises a reward to that fish, but it's also meant to hide the high price it's going to pay to go after that reward and receive it. That's how temptation works. Temptation promises a reward. Temptation promises the life that we think we want, but it hides the high price it costs to get it. And it always comes with a price. So we're going to see Satan luring Adam and Eve. And, 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 and so Satan comes to Eve and... He says, he knows everything's perfect with her, so he, he, he's got to get underneath. So he says, did God really say that you can't eat from any tree in the garden? So he, what is he doing there? He's trying to make God sound bad. Because we know what God said. Of course, they could eat from all the trees, just the one. So he's trying to make God sound bad. There's all these trees here, and God said you can't eat from any of these trees. He's trying to make God sound bad. Not even bad, cruel, mean, right? Can't eat from any of these trees. I'm just going to put them all in front of you. So he's trying to make God sound bad. He's trying to create doubt in their minds that God is good. And so Eve says, well, well, no. Um, He says there's just the one tree that we're not supposed to eat from, and we're not even supposed to touch it. Well, God didn't say that, did he? So has the, the doubt that God is good just begun a little bit in our mind? So now Satan steps up the attack, and now he just outright lies. And he says, he basically mimics God, he mocks God. He says, God, he says, you will die not. In other words, you will not die. He's saying that God is a liar. He's calling God a liar He says, God isn't being truthful with you. So how could God be good? You're not going to die. He can't be good. God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes are going to be opened, and you're going to be like him, knowing good and evil. So Satan questions God's truth, and he also questions God's love. So the lie, the lie is this. God is not good. That's the lie he wants them to believe. God is not good. So in other words, you're missing out. 
You're missing out. There could be something more that you could have been given. But since God is not good, he didn't bless you with that more. He's holding it back from you because he's not good. And now you're missing out what you could have had if God was good. And so what Satan did here is he created fear of missing out. Because they should have known they had everything. But he made them somehow get this fear that they were missing out, that there had been something better had God really been good. Because that's the core lie, that God isn't good. And so Satan used FOMO. His lure promised Adam and Eve that they could have more. He was saying, God is holding out on you. He's holding out. You could be like him, knowing good and evil. So how could God be good if he's holding back from you? Eve, you're missing out. And so both Adam and Eve feared missing out on what, on what Satan was promising them and luring them with. And now, now both Adam and Eve wanted more. And so when Eve saw that the fruit was desirable for gaining more, she ate it. And she gave some to Adam, her husband, who was with her <laughs> right there. She gave some to him who was with her, doing nothing to help her. And basically who was standing there waiting to see if she keeled over dead eating the fruit because that's exactly what God said would happen. So basically, uh, her husband is kind of sitting there letting her be the guinea pig, waiting for her to drop dead, because God said, if you eat this, you're going to die. She didn't drop dead. Oh, all right. Well, then I'm not going to miss out on that. Then he eats. Satan was right about one thing. Their eyes were opened all right. That was the one thing he was right about. When they ate that fruit, when they trusted him instead of God, their eyes were open. Because what does it say? It says that they realized they were naked. Never had realized that before. Now their eyes were open, and what do they realize? Not, not some great, oh, this all, here's all the stuff we missed. No, their eyes were open, and they realized that they were naked. That meant that something had gone horribly wrong in God's world. So Satan had hooked them with this lure, and he had pulled them away from God. Their relationship with God, which was perfect, had been shattered, as had their relationship with each other. Now, now they knew good as something they had lost, and they knew evil now as something that, had, that controlled them. They realized they were naked. And so in shame which they hadn't felt before, they were unashamed before, now in shame, they cover up. They clothe themselves. So now they're naked and ashamed. They had been naked and unashamed, this, having this relationship with God and with each other where there was nothing to hide, nothing to fear, no desire to escape, no need to project a, a better image of themselves. Naked and unashamed, missing nothing. Naked and unashamed. We've never felt that feeling. We have never felt that feeling. We know we're naked and we want to have clothes on. Right? I don't want you to fully know me because you wouldn't like what you see. And so I project a different image of myself. I project the image of myself that I want you to see. I don't want you to know me so much because, and, and so because I don't want you to know too much about me, I withdraw and I hide and I cover up and I clothe the real me. And so we put on layers and layers of clothes until people can't see anything. We busy ourselves, we distract ourselves, we project a better image of ourselves out there, which ironically causes other people to have FOMO, right? Right? Imagine, imagine being naked and unashamed, walking with God in the, in the cool of the day in the garden with nothing to hide and missing nothing. Sin destroyed all that. Sin shattered all that. And now, like, 
just like Adam and Eve, now we experience guilt and shame. They experience both guilt and shame. Both are terrible. There's a difference between guilt and shame. Guilt reminds us of what we've done. But shame, shame tries to convince us that what we've done is who we are. So guilt, guilt is that terrible feeling. Guilt feels terrible. When we've done so, so guilt says, I've done something wrong. I, I knew it was right. I knew it was wrong, but I, I, I chose what was wrong. And now I've, I've messed up. I've done this wrong thing. And I, it's, it's, I, I feel terrible because I know that I haven't done the right thing. I know that, that, that thermostat inside me is way off and I've done this wrong thing. And it feels terrible because I'm not lining up with God's will. And so it's that terrible feeling. And so I want to confess. I want to repent. I want to do the right thing. God, forgive me. Guilt is that terrible feeling that reminds us that we've done wrong. But shame destroys your soul. Shame convinces you that that awful thing you did is who you are. I'm an unlovable person. There's, there's something broken in me in different ways than it's broken in anyone else. I'm so broken that I'm, that I'm unlovable and I'm unfixable. Shame, shame tries to convince us that we're stuck. Shame tells you that, you're, that your failure is your identity, that your failure is who you are. And so now, now that's how we feel when we're naked, right? We, we don't want others to see who we are, so we hide. We, we clothe, we cover up the real me. And so we try to project a different image of ourselves, right? We don't want people to see who we really are. We, we want to show everyone that, that we're put together, that, we're, that, that we don't struggle, that, that we got everything under control, that we can handle it. We, we want to show people that, that we're truly, that we're worthy, and that, that we are good, that we are great, that we are lovable. We want to show people a good image of ourselves. Because deep down there's this voice in us going, well, what, what if people see that I'm not perfect? What if people see that, that I struggle? What if people see that I'm unlovable? What if people see what it is that's causing me shame? And so, what do we try doing? We try showing everyone that everything in our life is just fine and perfect. <laughs> and so we post stuff on social media that would make it look as if our life were a fairy tale. And then what does that do? Well, of course, that creates FOMO in the lives of others, doesn't it? When they see our perfect life, which isn't really a perfect life, it's the outer shell. So that causes other people to have the fear of missing out. And so what do they do? They up project even more of themselves, like, they, well, oh, no, this it's even better. And then so then we experience more FOMO. So you have this downward spiral and downward spiral of the more we project a different image of ourselves, the, the, the less satisfied others are going to feel, and it just feeds on itself. And here's what else. Let's say even when people do try to love you, you're not going to be able to receive that love because you're so busy trying to project a different image of yourself, it's going to be that image that gets loved, not the real you. We were created in the image of God. We are created in the image of God. We were created naked and unashamed. What happened? What happened? What happened is that Satan hooked us with the lure of wanting more. More than that? More than like not wanting anything? More than like needing nothing? More than, than having nothing to hide and nothing to be ashamed about? No, more than everything God has given us somehow? How is that possible? FOMO. Fear of missing out. And so we lost God's image. We, we utterly destroyed his beautiful, perfect creation. So what does God do? Does he come stomping into the garden after this happens, just blow everything up? Like, what does God do? He walks in. He doesn't come stomping in. I love that. He walks into the garden. 
calmly, calmly questions Adam and Eve about, oh, why it is that uh, being naked bothered them now? And he patiently listens to them as they, as they self-justify and blame each other. Adam actually blames that woman that God had given him as if to say, Lord, if you would have given me a better woman. And God listens to all of this, but they had lost everything. They had ruined everything. So they're going to get it now, right? I mean, they're going to get it. Um, But first, first God turns to Satan, and he says this. He says this to Satan. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. So he's saying, you made a mess here, Satan. You hooked my people and pulled them away from me to you with the lure of your false promises. But I'm going to unhook them. I'm going to bring this back to where it belongs. I'm going to make the the enmity, I'm going to make the wall, the barrier be be between you and the woman again, between you and people again, and not between me and them anymore. I'm going to to fix this. I'm going to put it back where it belongs. And how is this going to happen? Um, By someone who is the seed of the woman, the offspring of the woman is going to come to crush your head. So there's going to be a son who's born as a descendant of this woman who is going to crush your head when you strike his heel. Now, just so we don't go over that without getting it, like maybe a, a clear picture of that, um, what it means to crush someone's head and then while you get your heel struck. Well, let's just say that I was in a fight with somebody. And let's say that somehow I was able to use my heel. I'm, like, I'm, I, I can't picture myself doing this, but let's say I was u- able to use my heel to crush their head. But I bruised my heel when I did it. So... Their head got crushed, but my heels bruised. I have to ice it for the next three days. Any dispute as to who won that fight? Right? There's not going to be anyone going like, well, yeah, you did crush his head, but like you are icing your heel, so, you know, it was close. No, no, no. There's no, there's going to be no dispute as to who won that fight. This is what God is saying here. You're going to strike his heel. He's going to crush your head. That the son who's born of the woman, Jesus, who is going to be the seed of the woman, is coming to destroy you, Satan. He is going to destroy your work, everything you did. God is saying here, I am going to fix everything that's broken here through that person coming who's going to destroy you. I'm going to fix everything that was broken here. I'm going to unhook you from the devil. And see, the thing is, Satan remembered this. He remembered this. He knew the seed of the woman was coming to crush his head. So Satan thought he had to take Jesus out before Jesus could take him out. Satan figured that if he could kill Jesus before Jesus did what he came to do, that he would be home free and that he could stop being afraid and fearing about the promise that God made in the garden. And so Satan did everything he could possibly do to kill Jesus throughout his whole life on earth. Satan thought that the cross was his idea. It wasn't, though, was it? It was God's idea. The cross. The cross is how God unhooked us from the devil. The cross is how God fixed everything that was broken. The cross is how God made right everything that had been made wrong. And because of the cross, because of the cross, you are off the hook. Because of the cross, you are unhooked. So, you no longer have to buy into all those lies. You no longer have to buy into the lies that, that God is not good. Or, or the lie that, that, uh, that you could have more. The lie that God is holding out on you. The, the, the lie that that you could be getting something more. You don't have to buy into the lies that that, that thing you did wrong is who you are. You don't have to buy in the lie that, that you are an unlovable person or that you have to hide who you are. You don't have to buy into the lie that you're going to be missing out if you live life God's way. Because the truth is, here's the truth, 
God is good. That's the truth. God is good. And you are loved. That's the truth. That's the truth that Satan can't do anything about. He tries to lie. He tries to get us to think that God isn't good and that you could have more. But if, if, we, if we don't forget this truth, there's nothing you can do. God is good. You are loved. And so because that's true, because that's true, confess your faults. In, instead, of trying to, instead of trying to hide who you are, Instead of just living the exhausting life of trying to project this different image of yourself and pretend you're someone different, um, just confess. Just honestly open up with God about who you are. Be real with people around you. And you get to do that. You get to confess and just be real who you are without being afraid of anything. Why? Because God is good and because you are loved. And so that's why you can do this without being afraid. You get to be naked and unashamed because you know who you are with God and he loves you no matter who you are. So confess your faults and then change your focus. Change your focus. Rather than focusing so much on what you lack, focus on what you've been given. When Satan uses FOMO, the fear of missing out, when Satan uses FOMO to lure you into wanting more, remember how much you already have. God has given you more than you can imagine. And when you focus on that, when you focus on how much God has already blessed you with, no more FOMO. No more FOMO. Right? Right? So when we remember that God has given us more than we can imagine, when we remember that God has blessed us with everything we possibly need and there's nothing we need, there's nothing we want, there's nothing to hide, there's nothing to shame because of the truth is that God loves us and that God is good, no more FOMO. And that means Satan's lures just aren't going to look that good. And finally, it'll just be harder to feel that you lack the things you need when you're focused on the abundance that you already have. Why? Because, because God is good. Because you are loved. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for loving us. I just ask you to pour out your love and your comfort and that assurance on everyone here today, on this, on this, this community of believers here. Uh, remind us that you're good. Remind us that, that we're loved by you so that we don't have to go looking for something more elsewhere so that, we, so that this, this fear that, that we haven't been given enough or that there's something that's missing in our lives doesn't drive us away from you and take us in all kinds of dangerous places or unhealthy sort of actions and living and behavior in our lives. Just remind us of your word and, and comfort us and bring us back to the fact uh, back to the picture of your son dying on the cross for us. That's how much you loved us. And so we just don't need to go anywhere else looking for love. So strengthen our faith and just draw us to you and, and help us be your people in this world that, that live in joy and unashamed because you've given us all we need. And so we don't need to fear that we're missing anything. Give us that peace and comfort today in Jesus' name. Amen.